Good morning, everybody. This is Andrew Ross Sorkin, the founder of DealBook from the New York Times. And uh, we're thrilled to have uh, everybody join us once again this week on our deep DealBook debrief conference call, where we try to make sense of what often feels like a senseless world and uh, try to look to the future uh, and understand this pandemic and where things are headed. This week, uh, we're going to focus on the issue of retail, culture, and fashion. And we are privileged to have with us uh, Vanessa Friedman, who is the fashion director and chief fashion critic of the New York Times. And I'm also joined, uh, as always, this week by Jason Carrion, who is the deal book editor uh, based in London. Uh, we should tell everybody just some housekeeping, as uh, you may or may not know, this is an audio focused phone call. Um, if you're looking on Zoom uh, for a video of us, uh, we're not there. Uh, we do it this way in large part so that you can focus on other things that you might be working or doing other things. You can listen uh, to the call. Uh, we do want this to be as interactive as possible. So as you have questions, uh, please uh, ask the questions, submit those uh, right there in the uh, Q&A window. And I should also note that this uh, call is being recorded. We'll make a replay available on social media, likely this afternoon and then on nytimes.com and in tomorrow's DealBook newsletter. Um, before we uh, begin the conversation, I'm going to hand it over to Jason, who I think is really going to try to help set the table, if you will, uh, for this discussion. Jason. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, chart interlude here, just to set the scene, like Andrew said. Um, on your screen now, if you're looking, um, wanted to put up uh, some stats about U.S. retail sales growth. There's lots of charts we're seeing these days with lines going way down in the case of sales or way up in the case of unemployment, this sort of thing. But um, just wanted to show and highlight um, what's been happening to clothing stores and department stores. Retail overall is really suffering through the lockdowns. But if you look at, this is through March, um, department store sales year over year falling by nearly 30%, clothing stores falling by 50%, and that's March. And so there were still stores open at that point. April is going to be probably even, even worse. And something that's quite interesting that, that, that we've been following in DealBook is that this is reverberating throughout uh, the corporate world. Obviously, this week, you're writing about how um, a private equity firm, Sycamore Partners, is trying to pull out of a deal that it agreed just a few weeks ago uh, to buy a stake in Victoria's Secret. Um, we've also been following that Neiman Marcus is likely to file for bankruptcy this, this week. So it's really all happening in this sector. And just to set the scene for the, for the rest of the, of the, of the, of the conversation, um, just take a look at this uh, chart one last, one last time and see that it's, that it's really rough out there. And this only shows the very beginning of the crisis for the next few months and maybe even longer, we can, we, can, we can discuss, it will get even worse. Back to you, Andrew. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. And Jason's going to be combing through questions, which will, uh, will surface in just a moment. But as I said, our, our special guest today uh, is Vanessa Friedman. It is thrilling for us to have her because she is really at the center of so much of this news. She's been reporting it out. If you didn't get a chance to read it yet this week, she wrote a, a fabulous piece uh, with Sapna uh, called The Death of the Department Store. Very few are likely to survive. Uh, but she's really uh, sort of a microcosm of all of these issues because when you think about the department store, you think about fashion. When you think about fashion, you think about culture, you think about media and advertising and so much of it. And so really where I'd want to start with you, Vanessa, is sort of how you see, I hate to say the dominoes or how they fall, but uh, if you could sort of walk through the permutations with which this whole space you think is going to be evolving over the next several weeks and months. Sure. And, and first, just let me say it's really nice to um, to be part of this. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm glad everyone has joined us for this because it is an incredibly important story and one with so many repercussions that, you know, aren't even visible on that pretty horrifying chart that Jason just showed because clothing is not just about, you know, nice tops and skirts and dresses and suits that we all buy in stores, although that's part of it, you know, but it's about the people employed by those stores and the designers who make the clothes and the people they employ and the people who are involved in 
getting the clothes from you know one place to another and the garment workers far across the world who are part of this um, the taxes that these stores and designers pay the real estate that they occupy i mean there are so many potential problems with um with an issue in the clothing industry that affects all of us that it can be really um really scary you know and i think back back at the end of march you know we first started talking about this and at that point you know i was on the phone with tori birch and she said you know this industry could fail and that was a pretty scary idea and so when you think about this industry failing i mean right now there's so much focus on retail or what is considered classic traditional retail mm -hmm. um the department store, obviously, the, the retail store that we that we go in and touch the garments. E-commerce uh, still seems to be uh, robust or at least holding up under, under enormous amounts of pressure. But the question is whether you really do believe that there's going to be a step change, a material step change in the entire ecosystem as a function of this pandemic. I mean, the one thing I'd say first about e-commerce, e which people have talked about as a bright spot, you know, clearly for Amazon, it's a, it's, it's a bright spot. But for a lot of the retail um, companies that we're talking about, you know, their e-commerce business was maybe equivalent to a store in a network of 40 to a couple hundred stores. And even then, e-commerce has largely been down, not as much as retail clothing sales, you know, which are which essentially zero, but, you know, down 30, 40 percent. So I think seeing e-commerce as the kind of savior of this is, is really um, wishful thinking for many of us. And how much of it is an issue of companies and some of the department stores are maybe examples of this that are that are quote unquote over leveraged either they're owned by a private equity firm or uh they, they've taken on debt to fuel their growth and and that the biggest problem they're confronting right now is simply paying the mortgage if you will um as opposed to just these sort of larger forces at play that seem to be uh, making this this whole industry so challenged. Well, I mean, that's one of the immediate problems. You can't pay the rent if you have no revenue coming in. Um, you know, and you have a gigantic debt load, which many of these chains do, particularly Neiman's and J.C. Penney's. Um, but this was, you know, this was a really challenged sector even before the virus hit. You know, both because of the um, the way that the the companies were structured and because changing consumer habits you know people were not buying going shopping the way they used to shop they were shopping online they were spending their money on experiences you know there had been a kind of step change in attitude towards stores which you know for most of the 20th century were really the gateway to american consumers you know they were the they were the power um, holders in this equation, because if you were a designer and you wanted to get your products to people in this, you know, across the country, they were the way you did it. That has changed, you know, both because um, designer brands became much more interested in vertical retailing. So they would own, you know, own their own production line and own their own stores. And, um, and because, of e you spend a lot of time talking to various designers and people in the fashion business. Who do you look at right now, and I hate to say this, as the most vulnerable? And is there anyone that you look at right now on the other side of this uh, and say is actually in a, in a strong spot or has somehow figured this out in a way that others may not have? I think the, the middle-sized independents are in the most precarious position, the ones that have actually, you know, have stores and therefore have rent to pay, um, have fixed costs that they are grappling with, do not have a big pocketbook behind them, do not have a big owner who can finance them. Um, you know, very small designers actually 
may be in a better position because they have only two or three employees. They have no stores. They usually have some form of e-commerce. And, you know, if they sell a couple pieces a week, they can survive, you know, until they get to a point where things start open up again. And very big, you know, groups, especially the European luxury groups like um, Herring or LVMH, which own, you know, some of the, the most glamorous, glossy brands um, will be okay. But I think, you know, our middle range stores are really, our middle range designers are really in trouble. And they are often what we think of when we think of, you know, what American fashion is. Right. Um, so much of American fashion does, though, feel like it's now encompassed in big conglomerates like the LVMHs of the world. What does happen to the, some of the big publicly traded companies? Well, I think, you know, PVH, um, which owns Calvin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger, is doing okay. But they also, you know, are, were very concerned about what happens to their, um, to all their employees, to their incredibly sprawling supply chain. Same with Tapestry, uh, which owns Kate Spade and Coach. And then you've got, you know, um, Capri, which has Michael Kors and Versace. So I think, you know, they are all in a slightly more um, risky position than LVMH and Caring, which are primarily, um, you know, which are much more sort of um, embedded in the, in the global retail right. uh, chain and, you know, are, and have bigger pocketbooks. Here's a crazy question for you. And I don't know if it's a, if it's an outlandish idea, but given the sort of power and force that we're seeing of the, of the Walmarts of the world, of the targets of the world, you, you talked about Amazon uh, mm. before. Is, is that the future of, of retail? Is it possible somehow that, f could, could we ever really see fashion, if you will, inside of Walmart? I know Target has tried in its own way. Amazon so keeps trying. Amazon yes. brings eternal with Amazon. You know, I, I really hope not simply because I think that it's good to have more options. And I'd rather not see a world where everything is consolidated under three brands that essentially own all of our lives. Um, but I do think there will be, you know, there will be real changes. I think these, these big department store chains will clearly slim down if they survive. You know, we may end up in a model that looks much more like Europe, where essentially you have something, um, you have a situation where the magic of one is prized as opposed to the magic of 100. You know, there was, uh, there has been an idea in the last couple years that the more stores you had, the better, because that way everyone could access your stuff at all times. It's the kind of bricks and mortar expression of the, of the digital universe. And I think that is, that clearly is part of the reason we're in, these stores are in so much trouble right now. They just have way, way too many doors. And, um, you know, it's not a bad idea to imagine one Neiman Marcus, you know, that's really special and is a kind of magnet slash monument that people travel for. Right. Um, given all the conversations you have with fashion designers, I'm actually curious what you think is going to happen to fashion come this fall, come next spring, come, this, come, come the, the fall after, given that you know, so much of the fashion world revolves around fashion shows, mm -hmm. both in New York and in Paris and elsewhere. What happens? Well, all, I mean, all shows have been canceled up until right. September. You know, the resort shows, which would be taking place next month, which, is, which were always in sort of far-flung destinations and great extravaganza were off the table. Menswear in June and July is off the table. Couture in July is off the table. You know, there's been talk about doing it digitally, but no one really knows what that's going to look like. And I think there are big questions around September. You know, there is no doubt that even if the shows do happen, you know, magazines are probably not going to be sending 10 people per magazine to Europe for three weeks to attend. You know, it's hard to imagine that kind of travel starting up again. It's also hard to imagine that anyone's going to have the budget to support that, given that most of these designer brands for, whose advertising is the lifeblood of the glossies 
have cut their marketing budgets. Right. So which lead which which leads to another question you've written about it. What happens to to the magazine, to, to the glossy magazine, the Vanity Fairs of the world, the Vogues of the world, uh, both of those, of course, owned by, by Condé Nast, but is it, are we going to see a step change in that industry as well? Well, there are so many questions floating around about it at the moment. I think, you know, these are all magazines that are highly dependent on advertising as opposed to subscriptions. Magazines like The New Yorker and Wired, which are subscription driven, are in a much better position right now than the Glossies, which are, you know, really linked to their to their clients. And, you know, there isn't talk really about print going away, but it's hard to imagine that behind closed doors that's not being raised. Uh, certainly that, you know, instead of 12 issues a year, maybe they would go down to eight, uh, six. Um, and, you know, and then the question becomes, what are they showing? How are they even doing shoots if everyone's sitting alone in their house and you can't send models and hairstylists and makeup artists and photographers off um, to either a studio or an island somewhere to, you know, to create the fantasies that, that drive those spreads. So that was the other thing I was gonna ask you. One of the things we've started to see on television is advertising that leans in and almost embraces this peculiar um, you know, social distancing moment. You know, do you imagine that, that the fashion designers that you spend time with are, are going to do that, that you're gonna somehow see it uh, be evoked in, in, in campaigns, in social media, and other things that they try to do in, in, the, in the way they even design clothes? Well, they certainly can't ignore it. You know, there'd be nothing more damaging than pretending it, this, this crisis that touches everyone isn't going on. And, you know, I think one of the biggest sort of existential questions hitting this, the fashion, the designer side of the industry is really how do you communicate about clothing at a time when everyone needs to get dressed? You know, this isn't, it's not a subject that is immaterial to people, and yet no one wants to think about it or talk about it as if, you know, it's the most important question of the day. It's clearly not. So how do you walk that line? You know, what does it mean to people? We're used to treating clothing as a way we communicate to the outside world, but now we're not in the outside world. So right. what does that do to the role of, you know, what do you have to put on every day? And, you know, these are all sort of core issues for designers right. you know on the other uh, hand and i just I, I feel this really strongly like people talk about this as wartime and if you look at what's happened historically in wartime afterwards people want to dress I mean, it, it's it's a right. interesting expression of freedom and and belief in the future so i have two two questions before i i, I turn it over to uh to all of the, the questions that have been flowing in that I know Jason's combing through as we speak. Um, one of which is just paint the picture, if you could, of what, what you think the world looks like two or three years from now. Meaning, do you really believe? <laughs> I, I, just, I, just, I just want to understand it. I mean, is it, maybe there are no magazines. I mean, or, or maybe they're all online and it's all moved to social media. Maybe everybody is doing a DTC, direct to consumer, uh, and they're advertising on Facebook. I don't know. I'm just, uh, you know, when you talk to all of these people in the fashion business and department stores and retail, what are, what are they telling you that, it, you know, what, what's their imagination look like? You know, I was having a conversation about this the other day with somebody and I said, what is it? Um, I said, do we go back? And she said, God, no, we don't go back. You know, that like banish that thought we have to go forward. And I think that is a really important point that this is, you know, as, as sort of grotesque as it can sound, this is an opportunity to think about some of the big issues that have beset fashion and the problems that people have been talking about for the last five to 10 years without really being able to solve them because there was so much forward momentum happening. No one could figure out how to get off the train. Now the train has stopped, you know, through nobody's, um, 
nobody's actions. And it's, you know, it is a time to rethink that. So maybe seasons go back to real seasons. One of the things that a lot of stores and, and brands have said is that, you know, summer is going to last longer this year. That sounds ridiculous. But what it means is that summer products that normally would be off shelves in like June may actually stay on shelves through the summer because right. people are buying less. You know, then fall products actually go into stores during fall. This is something that was talked about a lot five years ago. And people sort of used to call it see now, buy now, meaning right. consumers wanted to actually buy clothes they could wear at a time, at that time. And, you know, now there is an opportunity to reset the calendar that way. Um, on the other hand, we were on the, the call with LVMH for their Q1 results a couple days ago, and they said, well, summer is going to last longer, but we think of things will go back to normal soon. Well, and, and that's, where I wanted, that's where I want to end our conversation before, before we go to questions, which is, what do you think the timeline is for this and, 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 and timeline for buying? And I, I think we're starting to see a little bit of what that might look like based on on the experience in Asia, where we saw luxury goods sales literally fall to virtually nothing. But in certain in certain places, it appears like it has actually come back, arguably surprisingly so, no? I think a few brands have seen it come back, but um, immediately after reopening. But I think there is a lot of um, caution about whether that's something that will continue or whether it's a momentary resurgence, you know, after a lot of pent up weeks and, you know, it's not something that is necessarily sustainable or even, you know, going to continue through the next month. I think there is no question that it's going to take a much longer period of time for consumption to resume in whatever form it does resume. And I think that's still up in the air. With that, let me turn it over to Jason, who I know has so many questions for you. Yes, yes, very, very many. Um, thank you all for writing in. There's some, there's some really good ones. I'm going to group some of them together because there's a few themes um, emerging here. So here's one, Vanessa, from um, Stuart to kind of follow on about the impact on, on fashion at itself, which you describe as a way to communicate to the outside world. Stuart says, half the world has spent two months in sweatpants. I speak for yourself, Stuart, but still. How will that affect fashion after the lockdown? Is comfort going to be more important than before? And there's a few others that have come in to ask you about athleisure, which I think is a very popular uh, wear at the moment. I mean, I can tell you personally that when I am released from my house, if I never put on my jeans again, I will be happy. I actually have found myself desperately missing the days when I wore skirts and dresses. So I think, although there's a certain amount of reveling in the fact that people can kind of slounge around their homes in clothes that feel like pajamas, um, actually, after another month, two months of this, there will be a real return to a desire to get dressed. And I hope a real return to appreciation of quality and, you know, thinking very much about how we spend our money and what we're spending it on. There was um, such a rush um, toward fast fashion and toward just getting new stuff all the time before this happened. And this may well be an opportunity to change that and for people to think much more about what they're spending their money on. Right. And that seeks very nicely into a question from, from Gail, who asks, um, considering that the fashion industry as a whole had a big problem with oversupply, which you just mentioned, disposable fashion, unsustainable practices, et cetera, is there not a positive side to this decline? Granted, bad for the industry, but possible long-term good for the world. Yeah, absolutely. If we can claw back some of the craze. It's very hard as we were going through it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, there is no question this is going to be a very painful reset. If simply because of all the employment issues that are going to, that are associated with a constriction of uh, an industry that's this big. And the fact that it's been forced on people as opposed to managed is you know, is going to make it much worse. 
you know, one of the things that has always struck me about this is retail was so many of everyone's first jobs. It was so much of an entry point into the professional workforce. And if it shrinks dramatically, that may not be the case in the future. And that's kind of an extraordinary change. But, um, but at the same time, as you say, you know, we, there was simply way, way too much stuff in the world. And it had caused both a reduction, I think, in our own way of valuing the work of the human hand in what goes into making garments. And, um, and it was terrible, terrible for the environment. You know, we were destroying the world through manufacturing, through use of chemicals, through landfill, and all of that can, um, can be at least ameliorated a little bit if we rethink how much stuff we make and buy and throw away. And this is an opportunity to do that. Mm. And following on from that, a question from, a, from an anonymous listener here. What about all the people with no job? How will they afford new clothes? You know, when you were talking about being a bit more discerning or, or maybe, maybe buying less, is it just buying less or, or is, it, is it, you know, how will this like massive unemployment crisis we have coming and probably a pretty um, brutal decline in consumer spending, how, how does that square with, um, with kind of what you're talking about before? Well, I think when you're dealing with unemployment, probably you're, clothing is um is the least of it although mm. what you wear when you are trying to get a job does matter and um and that's why we have you know some really great um, organizations like dress for success which really focus on helping um people who are looking for employment um present themselves and with their image um and that's certainly something that people can think about and should think about donating to after this is over when you can actually give close away again to organizations. But, um, you know, I think simply learning how to take care of what you have mm. um, is also something that's, that's important. And, you know, it's something a lot of people have talked about in this time period, particularly when it comes to, you know, to cooking and to, to keeping house. But it's also true with clothing, you know, learning how to mend and iron and wash you know, will contribute to the, the lifespan of a garment and mean that what you have already actually can be, can, you know, can be had for the long term, which is how we should think about clothing. You know, that's not a disposable item. It should be something you invest in and you take care of and you pass on. Right, right. Um, there's a few people uh, I've written in to ask uh, variations of this. Gabby is one of them. What are your thoughts on off-price retailers like Burlington Coat Factory, Ross, TJ Maxx, those types of chains? Where do they fit in all this? I think they provide a really important service and that service is going to be extremely important um, at the moment as we go forward because you know this hit just as a whole new season was entering stores and that new season you know whatever is not sold during e-commerce is probably going to go to the off-price stores. You know, if it's not, if it's not completely seasonless and can last forever, you know, clothes that you wear in April on sale in August can be an iffy proposition. So I think, you know, the TJ Maxx and Ross are going to have really important roles to play going forward. Um, and they're part of the ecosystem. Yeah, definitely. Speaking of ecosystems, let's let's get back to talking about department stores because that's that's probably the most uh, popular genre of, of of question that's that's coming in. Um, I'm going to set these two questions sort of against each other. Evan asks quite bluntly, "Is there a reason for large department stores to exist?" You know, question mark, full stop. And versus um, Barb, who writes in that she's someone who loves shopping in, in person at department stores. What do you think could replace that shopping experience where you can buy numerous categories of items in one place and also have a drink and lunch and, and, and all that kind of thing? Those are two extremes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I also love shopping in person. So I'm with Barb on that. But I also, I think that um, the issue with department stores has been that they all became very similar and they became very overextended. And then you have 
all these stores that are kind of the same and they kind of have the same stuff and there's no particular reason to go to any one of them. And I think stores have got to give people a reason to go through their doors. And part of that is point of view. Part of that is assortment. Um, part of that is service. And all those characteristics are going to become really important when things reopen. You know, I think that the store management is going to have to think very hard about what their identity is, what the, their reason for being is, and why, um, and what they can do for their customers in a way that maybe they haven't thought about for a very long time. Right. Stu asks, what would it take for you personally to shop inside a department store <laughs> again? And there are other questions that kind of related to that about what the retail experience will be like. As somebody who enjoys shopping in person for a while, I think, even after things open up, that's going to be a very different proposition and maybe for even, even longer. You know, I go to department stores to discover things, to see how somebody, see what choices a buyer makes, to see how they put things together. And that doesn't, that won't change. But I do want that sense of discovery. And when you walk into a store and it looks just like another store, then you turn around and walk out again, because why should you be there? So I think that that kind of very specific taste level is going to be very important. I think, I also, you know, I think that um, how stores behave during this time period is going to be very important. You know, you've heard about brands, you know, refitting their factories so that they can make masks or hospital gowns, you know, whether it's Brooks Brothers or L.L. Bean or Xenia in Europe or Dior or Vuitton, um, both in Europe and in the U.S. And I think that that kind of civic awareness is going to be important to consumers and they are going to remember it and pay attention to it. I think that how brands and how department stores treat their employees during this time period is going to be important. I think, you know, the ability to be part of a community and to create a community has always been something that mattered in the health of a store. And I think that is even more true now. And do you think that will filter through after, after this, after the crisis, will some of those brands who do it, who do it well, however we define that, will that give their brand a bit of a halo effect or will 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 help them on on the way out things like absolutely um, treating absolutely. their employees better and all that yeah yeah i mean i think you know just seeing the reaction on social media to some of the the news of you know what people are doing has been really striking to me you know seeing people saying oh i always like this brand i'm going to shop there now afterwards i'm going to remember this you know it it really is um it's loud and it's consistent, and I think it is going to uh, reverberate. Right. A couple of questions about accessories, which we haven't talked about specifically yet. What, well, Teparidis asks, what about the accessory side of fashion? Um, mm -hmm. They're a feel good and easy item to purchase, um, after, especially after a crisis. And then a related question from, from Surveyne asking about cosmetics specifically and how that works when you can't or maybe won't or are afraid to go to a department store and try them on in, in mm -hmm. person. I mean cosmetics and beauty in general I think has actually done been more resilient um, in the mm -hmm. last couple of weeks than clothing for obvious reasons you know it's something that you can do at home it's something you can do to make yourself feel good um, they are relatively uh, accessible price-wise and I think that will continue. I think, you know, it's been a real disaster for a lot of the freelance industries associated with beauty, like makeup artists, stylists, um, hairstylists, and, um, you know, those, that, that segment of the, um, the working population is in real jeopardy right now and having a really difficult time. Um, in terms of accessories, RMS just reported its results, and that was interesting because they are, you know, much more uh, a leather goods company than a ready to wear company. And they have done relatively better than a lot of their peers in luxury, perhaps because of that, because people have been more willing to, um, to buy bags uh, than clothing in this time period. Um, and, you know, and because they represent quality. And I do think that 
quality matters. Right. There was a stat in your story this week about the death of department stores that really caught my eye, which is that in the U.S., 30% of mall square footage mm -hmm. is, a, is, is a accounted for by these, by these big department store chains. There's two questions here from Dave and Don mm -hmm. that, are, that are kind of getting at this. What will replace mall anchors if, for example, JCPenney's and Neiman's go away? And then Don asks about, like, just what's going to happen to the mall besides empty space there? Is there anything else that we should be concerned about when, when these massive anchor tenants potentially vanish? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, of that 30%, 10% alone is just Sears and JCPenney. It's really wow. it's extraordinary. And JCPenney, you know, is one of the, one of the names that is currently, you know, being talked about as exploring bankruptcy options. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty scary situation. I think malls are in real trouble. You know, malls were in trouble beforehand and they are in even more trouble now. And if you lose a tenant like that, particularly at a time like this, who's gonna go into that space? You say, you know, not a gym, not, not another store, um, probably not a restaurant. So I don't know. And then if you lose the mall, there are whole communities that have grown up around the mall to serve the mall. You know, people who work at the mall, there are highways built to serve the mall. Um, mm -hmm. So again, like the, the repercussions of this particular um, destination, dis destinations disappearing are, are pretty large. And I think malls as a concept are in trouble and may not survive, or many of them may not survive. Yeah. A final question from from the audience here, and, and and I think this is this is this is both negative, but also maybe maybe positive. Thinking about so this this is from B Man. Thinking about J C Penney, Sears, some others. They had problems because of poor management. Who do you think has good management? Has excellent management? There's there's another interesting thing in in your in your piece about how Nordstrom mm -hmm. has analysts think. 12 months of liquidity that they can ride this out, whereas Macy's has only four. Talk about management a little bit to end this. Who's doing well? Well, I think when you've got your, when you're family owned, when you've got your name over the door, it completely changes your relationship to a store. You know, it changes the way you think about it, changes the time frame of investment, um, probably changes how much pain as an owner you are willing to undergo personally in order to make sure that um, your company survives. And I think you see the same thing in a way with LVMH and Caring in Europe, where even though they're public companies, they are majority owned by families that are extremely closely associated with those groups. And um, I think we're seeing, again, the value of that kind of emotional attachment that goes beyond um, a balance sheet. That's a great place to leave it. Thanks so much, Vanessa. And thanks everyone for your questions. I'm gonna hand it back to Andrew for some closing remarks. Great, uh, Vanessa, thank you. Uh, Jason, thank you for so deftly uh, handling all those questions. Um, I wanna thank everybody for calling in uh, this week and to tell you that we will be doing this again next Thursday. So mark your calendar. We'll also be doing a deal book helpline on Tuesday, uh, we'll provide the information on how to get involved in that conversation in tomorrow's newsletter as well. Um, real quick, the New York Times is doing all sorts of digital and virtual events over the next several weeks and months. Uh, you can find out all about them at timesevents.nytimes.com. I uh, wanna thank everybody again. In the meantime, please stay safe, healthy, and sane. We'll see you tomorrow in the newsletter in the morning and next week on the call.